So uh, Howard has asked me to, to focus uh, primarily on the, um, the issue which is very common with developers and even you know, operating businesses. So very common fact pattern where you have a, uh, e either somebody that owns you know, plot of land um, or a, you know, a, a plot of land with a building or an operating business, and they own those assets before 2018, the effective date, January 1st, 2018, the, the first effective date for the Oper Opportunity Zone program. And uh, so it's, you know, probably comes up in about 25% of cases. It's like, hey, I already have this, but um, I know I, it doesn't automatically qualify because it's outside of a qualified opportunity fund. So how do I make this work? And um, that's what we'll uh, primarily be talking about. Uh, I'll also be talking about some of the, some of our st structuring, um, you know, things that we've seen out there in 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 real life. And then also I'll be touching on the uh, the new regulations which came out uh, the. Uh, last week of December, which was just, um, you know, we were glad to see him. We weren't really happy with the timing because uh, CPAs had a, our hands pretty full with uh, year-end tax planning. Again, just to give you a quick overview on, uh, on HCVT, Holt House, Carlin and Van Trite, the firm that I work for, we're a LA-based firm. Uh, we've been around for 27 years now. We have 12 offices, nine in California. We have a Phoenix, Park City, and Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, so we're we about 70% of our practice uh, is in uh, tax. We have a very high concentration of uh, real estate investors, developers, uh, also some very large private equity firms and, and kind of what I work on mainly is serial entrepreneurs. Uh, we have about 700 uh, team members throughout our firm. And um, as far as our opportunity zone practice, uh, I have uh, six, six people uh, primarily in Park City, uh, Long Beach and our uh, LA office uh, that work on these. Uh, we've, again, we've done 30 formations of QAFs and then uh, many more QOZBs, the subsidiary entities. And then on, on top of that, we, we consult with, uh, with non-client uh, QAFs and QOZBs just because uh, people get stumped on, on different issues. At the back of the presentation, there's a bunch of links uh, to articles and podcasts and including uh, Vicki and Ron's. And um, so that, that's, that's a pretty good uh, resource for some of the information I'm going to be sharing tonight. So uh, there's really, there's really uh, a, a min minimum of four ways that you can get this pre-2018 asset into uh, your, your qualified opportunity fund. Uh, and eventually down into the QOZB uh, subsidiary. And, uh, and each one has some, some pretty unique uh, tax ramifications. And so it's good you know, to, to kind of understand the pros and cons of each, each one of the uh, you know, ways to, to get it into the uh, QAF. So you can, you, you know, the, the, the most normal would be you would sell the land to a qualified opportunity fund or, or directly to a QOZB, uh, you could contribute the land to uh, the QAF. Uh, the landowner can enter into a ground lease with either the QAF or more likely the QOZB, or you could do uh, what we'd call a land swap, uh, which could, could be a 1031 or it might not be a 1031. Not, may not re meet the criteria, but um, you know, they uh, getting getting the asset in that way. The last two generally are not going to provide you any of the tax advantages of the uh, Opportunity Zone program as far as the step ups and the ultimate exemption, but it gets you in the game, and you may end up, you know, 
foregoing the the step up on those assets, but you might have some cash from another transaction that would give you the tax the the tax advantages of uh, directly investing into the quaff. So. Um, Selling the land, uh, the, the first and, and most normal uh, structure, uh, you, you have to watch out for the related party rules. And uh, so the related party rules kick in uh, whenever the owner or group of owners of the, the property, if they sell it and then end up owning cumulatively more than 20% of the quaff, then, uh, then the related party rules kick in. And there's two ramifications of, of that, that rule getting triggered. One is the gain that you generate on that, on that uh, cell uh, is not an eligible gain. And uh, it gets a little more complicated. The, the IRS actually in the final regs basically said, hey, we're just going to, we, we, we look at, you know, if a condition of selling is that you're going to put the money right back into the quaff, that's just a circular flow of cash. And we're going to just collapse the whole, the whole transaction. And there's no taxable gain on it. It's just a tax-free contribution you made. So, so you don't even have, a, a qualified investment because you didn't create a, a gain from that property. Now you could have a gain from another transaction and, and we'll, we'll get to that when we make just a straight contribution of the, uh, of the asset. But um, so, so once you trigger this 20% and you're investing into that quaff, you, you pretty much, your, your deal, you know, from the investor side, you're not going to get any benefit for that, um, that sale uh, and reinvestment. Now, the other ramification is to the quaff itself and the other, which will affect the other investors. So again, if you trigger that more than 20% test, now the, the other, the other, shareholders or owners of the of the quaff they they're they're in that quaff ends up holding an asset that is a non-qualified opportunity zone asset and uh, so that that should scare you but it's not fatal uh if the because and we'll get into this a little bit more but the a, a qualified opportunity zone business the subsidiary entity can hold 30% non-qualifying assets or what we call bad assets. And so if the, if the value of the land that they purchased, if they're gonna develop that, so you know, a common situation is they spend $10 million on a piece of property, but the whole project is uh, gonna be worth 50 million, then uh, you, you know, you, you've only got 20% bad assets, so you're you're, you're going to be fine. Uh, but it, it is something to, to watch, and and it's an unexpected result uh, for for people that make make these investments. I have to give this bad news to about three to four people a week that their deal that they already structured is is bad. <laughs> um, so even if the seller remains under 20% or under, um, it, the asset when it when that land or the land and building when it goes into that project is still is still a uh, um, uh, a a bad a bad asset. I'm sorry, it's not a bad asset, but it, to the to the investor, they're still not going to be able to invest that hypothetical gain that they thought they had when they sold it. And, and put it into the, uh, the quaff. Um, so again, in most cases, if it's a development project, the, pro the project itself is large enough and the, and the future investments to, to build the building on the property is gonna be big enough that it deflates 
the land value sufficiently that you don't violate the 30% test. Uh, but the caution is in, if it's a resi you know, let's say it's a, a residential project, you know, single family or a duplex or something, some oftentimes the, the building costs are not 70% um, or more of the total project. So you have to watch this, these rules really, really carefully if it's a residential project, uh, commercial um, and, um, you know, high rises, those types of things, invariably, the land value is is less than 30%. The investor in, the, in that fact pattern, if you're selling it and then just taking those proceeds and reinvesting them into the project, the IRS, uh, based on some old revenue rulings from the, the 80s, say that's just a circular flow of cash. It's no different than you contributing that asset to the QAF it's a non-taxable event in most cases. Now, if you had liabilities in excess of your tax basis, you could still generate a gain. And in that case, you would, uh, you would be okay. But um, in, in, in most fact patterns, you're gonna have a, um, a transaction that is not gonna give that investor any benefit. So what's, it, the, what's the 20% rule? Uh, the twenty per, the twenty percent rule is to determine if you are a related party. So so the difference between staying under the twenty percent test is you the property when it goes into the quaff is still a good asset if if the selling owners of the land or the land and building stay under 20%, then, then that, that is a good asset. It's a qualified opportunity zone asset sitting in the fund. That's, that's really the only, that's the only difference between violating the 20% or not violating it. But for the seller, even if it's 20% or less, it still is not a taxable event or IRS won't treat it as a taxable event. So that you won't, you're actually by, keeping that 20 percent it there are no capital gains generated correct correct but but like i said if you if you generated a gain from some other transaction uh you 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 still could be in the game i'm going to get i'm going to get to a structure that that may be a workaround on this uh in in just a second okay um so the so the potential results would be you know, if if the um, the non-qualifying or the bad assets in the in the the, the QOZB exceed thirty percent, then you're going to have your quaffs not going to uh, meet meet the test that your your QOZB won't, and then you'll have penalties which run at five percent per year and are assessed every six months, and um, and if you don't fix this over time, you could you could blow the whole whole quaff. So it's just something that you have to really really watch out for. So and again, it, it just limits your ability to reinvest uh, tax gains on the on the sale of you know land or any other property that's going to go back into the same project. Now let let me uh, let me just move on to this, uh, which which looks. Looks fairly complicated, but it's it, this, the concept is, and I haven't, you know, fortunately, this wasn't addressed in the regs. I thought it might be, uh, but but one workaround that I came up with, um, early, you know, early on, was because this this issue is so commonplace, is what if. You know, and, and it, uh, admittedly, it's a little clunky for the, you know, real estate developers in the room because you, you do have to add a ground lease. But what if you, you bifurcate a, a real estate project into and you, you make a, a land quaff on the left hand side of the, the screen and then you establish a building quaff. And so taxpayer in the middle there 
who owns this pre-2018 land sells the land to the land coif, takes that cash and invests into a building coif. And so they're, they, my, my argument is they, they haven't violated the related party rule at all because they don't have any skin in the game in, in the entity that now owns the land that he used to. And so now he's moved the money over to the building coif. And again, I pr presume this is just raw land that's purchased. And now they build a tower and he's, you know, part owner of that. And, uh, and again, you you would have to have a ground lease for, you know, a very long period of time to, you know, you, you don't want somebody having control of your land that you're, you just built this, you know, mega building on. And personally, I think th this clearly meets the letter of the law. Uh, what I can't tell you, and we won't know probably for a couple of years, uh, but I might, I might actually go, go for a private letter ruling on this because if this works, I, you know, this, this is a fix in, in you know, probably 75% of real estate development projects. And um, so, so the caution in red there is, there's a, an overarching anti-abuse provision in the regulations. And if you're looking at the new 544 pages of regs, go to the very bottom and that's where the anti-abuse examples are given. They don't mention this, nothing close to this, but I do worry a little bit that, you know, cause it's such overarching language that it basically says, if, if we look at a transaction and we feel that it, uh, overrides the purpose of the program and you've structured something that we don't like, we'll unwind it. And, um, but, but I do, I do think again, this, uh, this is something to explore. There's, there's, uh, you know, definitely risk to it, but, um, I, uh, like I said, I, I'm, uh, I, I plan on getting a private letter ruling at some point on, uh, on trying to see if this this works because I th I think it works because if you're cut out of this this the left side of the the project the land um, I I don't see how they can apply the uh, related party rules to you. Uh, moving on, uh, the second uh, way to get your property into the project is just a a straight contribution of the land. Um, now. The, the great thing about this is if you contribute the land, the related party rules have no application. And so you can, you can have more than 20% ownership in, uh, in the quaff. And so this is again, a very common situation where somebody's sitting on a piece of land, they want to co-develop it with somebody else, but they want more than 20%, you know, they want 51, they want 75 in some cases. So this is, this is a great workaround of the related party rules, but there's a couple of, you know, a couple of issues that you have to watch out for. Uh, on the positive side, no gain is triggered on the transfer unless there's a mortgage or other liabilities that are higher than the, than the contributor's tax basis in the property. Uh, and that can happen if they've done a cash out refi or something that that's not a not a completely unusual case. But in most most of the fact patterns I deal with, they they don't have uh, large mortgages and often they don't have any mortgage on the on the land. It's something they've had some legacy piece of land they've had for you know a decade or two. Uh, so now they're contribute they contribute the party. Um, they, now, now that you're going to have, since you're not triggering a gain on this, which wouldn't be a good gain anyway, so you'd have to have, and here's one of the rubs, you, you'd have to have a capital gain from some other investment. But what I find with dealing with developers and things, they've always got some deal, you know, they're, they're you know, they've got on this cycle of, you know, selling deals, you know, five years out from the time they built them. So they're, they're always dealing with, with uh, gains popping up. So, but, but you just keep that in mind. You, you're gonna, and, and contributing this is, under the second set of regulations 
is just like just like reinvesting cash. So uh, with the exception of the, the, you know, the basis issue that you have to watch out for. Um, I'd the, like to stop, uh, stop you there a second. Did yeah. you understand this concept? You can transfer the property, but you, better, you can't participate or get the benefits from the capital gains unless, uh, rather the benefits from the opportunity zone, unless you're contributing capital gains. So you got to have capital gains from some other transaction. Uh, and it doesn't have to be specific. It's just if you got capital gains and it's within 180 days, correct me if I'm wrong, that's how you would apply it. Right. Yeah. So, so I had somebody that in this exact situation and they, uh, and so what they, they did is they just, they, they had a bunch of portfolio gains from their stocks and bonds and they were a little short. So they just, you know, it was a good year in 2019. So they just had their uh, broker sell off, you know, another hundred thousand dollars of, of, uh, of capital gain uh, uh, property and uh, made, it, made it all work. So let's take an example of somebody that had a piece of land. They had a million dollar basis in it, but it's worth two and a half million. So if they contribute that, they only get, their, their, their qualified investment in the QAF is only the tax basis, the million dollars. The extra million and a half, they get credit for with the other partners and things, but that's a non-qualified investment so that piece of the investment would not get the step ups that we talked about uh, in years five, seven, and ten, and uh, and so that is uh, you know again a, you know another another negative on this, but it still gets them in the game game, and and let's say they're in a state that's non-conforming like California or Massachusetts. Mississippi or North Carolina, those are the four states that, that didn't adopt at the state level. So if you're in that situation, this is a great structure because you don't generate any federal or state gain, uh, but you still, you're, you're still in the, in the game. And in that fact pattern, I just shared with you two and a half million value, only a million dollar tax basis, a million and a half would be would, would create a mixed fund. You know, one layer is eligible for the benefits, the one and a half million not eligible for the benefits. Number six, the best assets to contribute if you're using this strategy, you want, you want your basis very close to fair market value. That's where you're gonna get the most juice out of the program. And we, we were working on a project, uh, actually it was Utah developers, but a California project. And they and the, the the guy that owned the land, he had three parcels, and two of them had large they, a big difference between tax basis and fair market value, and those those we decided he would just sell, but the the asset that was very close to fair market value and basis that one we we decided to contribute and uh, to give him the. The best, uh, the best benefit out of the deal. This area is so fact specific, and um, you know, pr probably each intake on a new client takes you know at least an hour because you you know you have to go back and find out what what's the source of your original gain, you know what what are you investing in, who are all the parties, and you know just when you think everything's okay. You know, some as you ask more questions, some other issue pops up. So uh, you have to be very careful about the specific facts on on every deal. So now moving on to ground lease, uh, the third third way to get the asset in. We've kind of already touched on this, so this should go pretty fast. So so this is you know you you have a lot of times you have a family has owned that you know this this asset for a long time, and if they don't need to really monetize it anyway, and they and they kind of like, you know, now, now all of a sudden they may be getting, you know, because you're going to build some, you know, you know, big commercial property or a, a a tower office building or something where their their rent, you know, your rent's going to go through the roof. You know, why not hold on to it? 
You're not generating a gain. Uh, now, again, they're not going to participate in the um, all all of the Oz benefits, but uh, they're still they're still in a in a very valuable uh, project. So uh, this works out pretty well in situations where people just you know they they like to collect rents and things. They can you know they can still participate. They could invest up at the quaff level with cash from other gains. Uh, and then just collect rents uh, on on the land. Uh, now, if the uh, if the taxpayer uh, the, le the less uh, the lessor ends up um, owning more than tw twenty percent of the quaff, then um, the, the, a second set of related party rules apply, and the um, you know the 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 quaff needs to, which isn't really a problem in a real estate deal, but they would have to lease or purchase uh, a, a like amount of of other properties. So they don't want you, you know, they, they don't want a related party lease and and the the quaff not to to make other investments. Again, in a real estate deal, it's it's a slam dunk. They're going to meet that. But I've had, I, I work, I probably, you know, 30% of my projects are operating businesses. And so uh, we've had a couple of situations where they were, there was going to be a related party lease on, on machinery and equipment in a, in a manufacturing plant. And so they, you know, I, I told them you can do that. Uh, they're treated as, even though it's used, it's a weird thing in the lease rule, anything you lease you're treated, the new owner is treated as the, the first owner of that property is treated as new. So you don't have to make improvements or anything to it. But again, if it's a related party, you ha they have to go out and either buy that same amount of value or lease the same amount of value so it doesn't look like a kind of a sham transaction. Uh, a, couple of, a couple of requirements for the lease to be good is you can't have any lease prepayments beyond one year. I had an East Coast project, Massachusetts, a multi-billion dollar real estate deal, and, and they started describing the structure to me, and they said, oh yeah, well we, you know, we prepaid all of the rent on a 40-year lease. That was, that was part of the thing, and it's like, you can't do that. <laughs> and uh, so you, you gotta watch that, and then you also, uh, any options to purchase must be at fair market value. And, and they're specific in the final regulations that you don't, you can't sit there and say, oh, the fair market value of this land that we're, that we're going to, you know, just lease uh, to get around the rules. Uh, let's, let's say it is a million dollars, but it's a, a 20 year lease. You can't sit there and go, okay, I'm going to buy it in 20 years, but I get credit for all the lease payments that I've made. That's not a fair market value deal. So they look at the fair market value at the end of the lease. So you can't, again, you can't play games there. So uh, what we're building in is, is just a, a, a right of first refusal at least that the, the people that own the building, the, the, the coif that owns the building would have a right of first refusal to buy the underlying uh, ground. Uh, because what you don't want to have happen is the lessor sells that from out from under you and you could you could have some you know some party that you really don't want to deal with in uh you know the next 20 years uh, land swaps in section 1031 again this is this is not that different than the contribution um if you're just if you're just putting property in there or or uh so, somehow structuring a 1031 type transaction within an oz because you're not you're not buying into that opportunity zone, um, you're you're not going to get all of the the step ups and things. But we we're working on a project in Long Beach, and we've got a combination of you know well he, there's three different parcels involved. One will get sold, one's going to get contributed to the project, and and then there'll be a ground lease. So we, you know you can use and then they're going to do a 1031 on another piece of property with uh, 
on, on one of the parcels. So uh, you can really use all of these different uh, structures uh, for optimal effect, but you really need to do an analysis on each, uh, each one of these. So I did have a, a, a point here that uh, you also want to just pay attention to the semi-annual testing, especially when an asset is going to be a bad asset in there. And, and when you're in the development stage, sometimes those, those percentages will move on you and you just make, got to make sure that you're under the 30% threshold. Now, one, one provision that came in in the final regulations is they, they have a six month cure period. So even if you mess up and, and, and miss the, the 30% and the QA, QA, QOZB or the, you know, the 10% bad assets in a QAF, uh, you can, you, they'll give you six months to fix that. So you have a freebie uh, each, you know, each testing period to uh, even if you blow it to you can you have six uh, six months to fix it so you really sidestep the, the five percent uh, annualized penalty um, you know another another couple of comments because there's you know obviously a lot of real estate people in the room um, you know what, what what a lot of people don't you know don't view it as but it's it's powerful that uh, and I had a conversation on this today uh, with a California client, it, it's the Oz program is is such a perfect uh, fix for a blown 1031. And you know, any of you in the real estate world know, I mean, you got 180 days to close, and you know, you've got a shorter period to identify, and uh, you know, none of those go very smoothly, and a lot of them blow up. So let's say you do. You know, you've got a $5 million gain, you're rolling it over in a 1031 and, and day 179, you find out that, you know, you just can't get the financing to close it or there's some environmental issue. And now you're sitting there with a $5 million gain. The, you know, Oz is a perfect fix. You just, you just say, okay, fine. Uh, within 180 days, I'm going to roll that gain into, um, to a, a, an Oz fund, and now, now you can do a, a total development. You, can, you can't develop a project in 180 days, and you, you have to buy something that's already, already done, right? And so you can, you can go out and buy raw land, and you have, as we'll, as we'll get to in a few minutes, uh, you have as long as uh, 64, 64 months uh, to fix that. Uh, that 43 months, uh, you know, just just went up with the with the new regs. So so anyway, um, whenever whenever you hear somebody, uh, you know, pulling their hair out because their 1031 didn't work, you know, tell them, hey, Oz Oz is the fix. Uh, I had a I have a client in um, Sonoma that had a you know three third generation you know, a building they've held for three generations, sold for $50 million gain. Um, they were going to reinvest it in four pieces of uh, other par properties up in Northern California. And, uh, you know, they, they closed three. They didn't close one in time. We're gonna just going to roll that into a, into a quaff. And uh, the bad news, because they're California, is there's, they're not going to sidestep. Um, they're not going to sidestep California tax, but it completely wipes out the federal. <laughs> um, so uh, just and some of this is just kind of high level overview. Uh, I know you guys are a pretty sophisticated group, but uh, the uh, you know as far as the the qualification requirements for Quaf, ninety percent of the assets must be. Uh, qualified Oz property. Uh, there's and there's three types of Oz property. It could be opportunity zone stock. And I'm going to tell you, the the 30 that we've done, no stock involved. You know, it's we're all, we're using almost exclusively limited partnerships. If you're dealing with California, you want to do a limited partnership so you don't get tagged with the LLC fees on gross income, uh, which can add up 
a lot over 10 years, uh, you know, at least $110,000 if you've got 5 million in gross receipts during the year. Uh, or it can be an Oz partnership interest, LLC tax is a partnership, or it could be direct to Oz business property, which again, land, building, et cetera. Keep in mind, you can only have, and a lot of people don't understand this, you can only have two tiers of legal entities you know, partnership above a partnership, or you could have a corporation holding a partnership or another corp, uh, or you could have, and you can have a disregarded entity down below. So technically you could have an LLC disregarded entity. You could technically have three, but from a filing standpoint, you can only file two tiered returns. And another another thing that people overlook, you know, the, there's a lot of misconceptions out there, is that a quaff may not invest in another quaff. Uh, so uh, a, a lot of times somebody will say, "Oh, I I found this great investment. They've already formed their quaff, and they say I want to invest in that quaff." And we say, "Sorry, you can't invest in the quaff, but we need to go talk to the quaff managers and see if they'll let us." invest directly in the QOZB, their subsidiary entity. Every, in every case, they've allowed it, but I had an Indiana project where it, they, it was a really screwy situation where the city had uh, built in all these um, entitlements and, uh, and, and tax incentives for the investors, and they wouldn't let us invest down at the uh, QOZB level. So we're still trying to work through that. And uh, I think we'll, we'll we'll be able to do it in 2020, but we weren't able to do it in 2019. See how fast I can talk when the time is running out? Uh, this is uh, uh, kind of the, my core group uh, of people to contact, um, hcvt.com. You can go on there and, and we have, a, we have a, all these articles posted, but uh, here's a bunch of, uh, of other uh, useful websites related to uh, Opportunity Zone investing. We even included the Las Vegas Opportunity Zone investors group there. Um, and we we also didn't forget Vicky and Ron. And uh, I think I'll, I think I'll close there and uh, open it up for questions. I know it's been a long evening and. Some of this stuff's dry, but uh, I appreciate your attention and good questions. And, and Howard, thank you again for all your prep and uh, sorry about the technology issue. Yeah, there's an there's a awful lot of moving parts. There, there's a lot of really bad information out there. I, I mean, I, probably a third of my calls are, you know, hey, somebody told me that this is the way it works and it's, you know, it's, it's just not right. And it, but it's just very complicated. It's, uh, and I, you know, there's not a week that goes by that I don't learn something new and, and some little nuance that uh, I didn't know. So, Blake, thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And I'm going to sign off. Great job.